Hey Terra Firma, Giles here. Day 4 and 12 on the best damned vacation spot in the solar system. Let's do that daily rundown, yeah? I swiveled my chair, kicking back to prop my boots on the console. It was time I got this log out of the way. My personal vids were more entertaining, but bureaucracy demanded its tribute. Atmosphere, nominal. Hab in top shape. Usual cracks forming here and there, but nothing the auto sealers can't handle. O2 at 77%, right where we like it. Food stores, huh, running a tad lower than I anticipated. Need to cross-check those supply manifests. Water reclamation. Hey, now that's a sweet 96% efficiency right there. Well done, Giles old boy. I slapped my thighs, chuckling. Not bad for a botanist turned glorified Martian janitor, eh? But that's how it was here. The Ares Three Colony. Five scientists, one glorified janitor. External conditions. Hmm. I swiveled towards the viewport. The endless expanse of swirling, rust-red dust, always a stark reminder of my isolation. One speck of humanity against an entire hostile planet. It was... invigorating. Dust clouds kicking up in the northern hemisphere. Visibility about half a click. Temperature at a brisk minus 60. Those solar panels are going to get buried again, damn it. I glanced at the time feed. Suit-up was almost inevitable. I sighed, scratching at my stubble. One more reason Earthside thought I earned hazard pay. Personal log time, I said, switching channels. Man, those protein bars are getting old. Wonder if I could grow a tomato in this grit. Probably taste like a rusty nail. Hey, now there's an idea for flavoring those bars. I tapped the recorder off. It wasn't like I had anyone to talk to, except those desk jockeys 225 million kilometers away. Another hour and I'd gear up, head outside to clear the panels. One panel down, six or seven more to go. Then maybe I could catch an hour of research on my pet project. The scrawny lichen samples from Valles Marineris. Proof of life on Mars had been the big discovery, but I had a hunch there was more to the story. Suddenly, the hab rattled. Not the usual shudder from wind. This was different. Rhythmic. Seismic alert! I bolted upright. No readings were flashing on the monitors. This felt external. I sprinted to the viewport just in time to see a section of the solar array shudder violently. A jagged line appearing. Before I could process what was happening, the entire panel was ripped loose from its moorings, disappearing into the churning dust cloud. The hell? More tremors. A sickening metallic screech. One of the secondary habitation domes. Collapsing? That was grade 10 structural alloy. I snatched up the comm unit. Hey, mayday, mayday, Giles on Ares 3. We have a major structural static. Every frequency dead as the Martian sands. My heart lurched and my gut went cold. I slammed the receiver down, rushing to the emergency override on the comms panel. The last resort. The signal powerful enough to punch through any localized interference, if there was anyone on the other end to pick it up. It took agonizing seconds to establish a link. Ares 3 to terra firma. Can anyone read? Major structural collapse and loss of comms. I repeat, Major. I froze. There was something out there. No, not something. Someone. A humanoid figure, all sleek angles and gleaming chrome, stood amid the swirling dust. It couldn't be more than a hundred meters away, head tilted as though listening to my transmission. The word listening was wrong. It was studying me, predator to prey. Panic clawed at my insides, and then it moved. Not with human fluidity, but a jerk, a reset almost robotic, towards the hab. No, I whispered. No, no, no. I was the last man on Mars, and it was coming for me. My mind was a whirlwind, a futile scramble for logic over a primal urge to scream. Training for this? There was no damn training for something out of a nightmare. I stumbled back, my eyes fixated on the viewscreen as the figure inched closer, obscuring the shattered remnants of the solar array. Think. Every astronaut had contingency protocols hammered into their heads. In my case, it was, stay the hell inside. I bolted for the airlock, 
fingers fumbling with the override. One press, decompressurize. Two more in quick succession, emergency seal. With a deafening hiss and a bone-jarring lurch, the inner airlock door slammed shut behind me. I collapsed against it, panting. Safe. For now. But every instinct, every rational thought, was drowned by the image of that chrome monstrosity etched on my retinas. I had to focus. Had to think like a scientist again. It wasn't natural, that thing. Too precise, too rigid to be an evolved life form. And dear God, how had it breached the hab? Computer, I croaked, moving shakily toward the main console. Scan exterior. Full analysis of... of whatever that is. Unable to compute, the AI replied, its usual placid intonations a surreal counterpoint to the chaos. Insufficient data on target. External sensors damaged. Of course, the damn thing had ripped through our eyes and ears. I needed visual confirmation. Override, I grated out. Emergency protocols. Access security cam feeds. Suddenly, one grainy security camera sprang to life. The exterior of the hab awash in swirling red. And there it was, hunched by the breached dome. Not human, not animal. It was a machine, segmented, its chrome surface pitted and scored as if it had been out there for... How long? It twitched, then slowly tilted its head. Directly at the camera. I swore, stumbling back. That was no blind animalistic movement. It knew. It knew I was watching. Think, Giles, think. There must have been signs, something we missed. I fumbled through geological surveys, mission logs from Ares 1 and 2. Dust disturbances, unusual seismic readings, anything anomalous. My pulse was a frantic drumbeat against the silence. Why here? Why now? And then it clicked. A report from Ares 1, a decade old, dismissed as sensor malfunction. Seismic tremors close to the colony, localized, rhythmic, not geological. They'd been here all along, under the dust, waiting. A metallic clang pierced the silence of the hab. My blood turned to ice. It was testing the airlock seal, measuring resistance. How long until it broke through? I was cornered. No way to call for help, no escape pods, and the nearest potential rescue mission was months away. The Ares Protocol, the one drilled into us since the Academy, was brutally clear. No heroics. Conserve supplies, minimize risk, wait for extraction. But this was different. This wasn't surviving a dust storm or a busted O2 regulator. This was extinction. And with extinction comes a chilling clarity. My fear wasn't of dying. It was of dying without answers, without a fight. Survival was no longer the goal. Understanding was. Giles, the botanist, the glorified janitor, was about to become Giles, the last damned Martian scientist. Panic had a shelf life. Once the initial shock subsided, a cold, analytical fury replaced it. I wasn't going to lie down and wait for that thing to break in. If I was going out, I was going out swinging. And along the way, maybe I could drag some answers out of this Martian hellhole. First things first. The suit. My movements would be clunky, oxygen limited. But I was safer in that walking coffin than exposed in the hab. The emergency lockers weren't designed for comfort, but survival was the priority. I wrestled into the bulky gear, the familiar seals and pressurization checks providing a sliver of normalcy amidst the madness. Next, my only weapon, my project. I sprinted to my workspace, the half-grown lichen samples looking almost pathetic under the circumstances. This wasn't about playing God and unleashing some bioweapon. This was about observation. We knew damn little about this planet, and even less about what might have been lurking beneath it. This lichen, tough enough to cling to life in the most extreme conditions, could hold the key to their vulnerability. I snatched up vials and slides, shoving them into the suit's storage pouches. One last stop. The Hab's tiny workshop. No guns, no explosives on a peaceful research mission, of course. My fingers skimmed past the usual tools, Useless. I needed a distraction, a way to buy time. The flare kit. Ignoring the flare gun itself, I pried out the cartridges, 
pocketing the bright red cylinders packed with magnesium and whatever else they'd designed to burn through a Martian atmosphere. It was a desperate gamble, a flashbulb against an armoured behemoth. But hey, when you're out of options, a Hail Mary pass becomes genius strategy. Emergency airlock depressurized, and I stepped into the swirling red wasteland. Each crunch of my boot on the iron oxide grit was deafening in the suit's helmet. I checked the comm systems one last futile time. Dead. Just the soft hiss of recirculating oxygen. My isolation was complete. The thing was waiting, as if it knew I'd come out to play. It had moved from the shattered dome, now studying the breach with an unsettling focus. Time for the experiment to begin. Step 1. Observation. It was taller than any human, closer to two and a half meters, and segmented. Pivoting joint mechanisms suggested hydraulics, some kind of internal power source. But the surface, pocked, scratched, ancient, it shouldn't have even been functional. Step two, provocation. Holding my breath, I lobbed a rock towards its feet. It didn't flinch, but that chrome head twisted, focusing directly on me. Success, it could see or at least detect me. Step three was the scary part. I fumbled a lichen sample out, holding it up. Nothing. No interest whatsoever. Then, on a whim, I crushed a bit between my gloved fingers. It reacted instantly. The segmented body straightened, and it took an ungainly step towards me. Was that curiosity? Or hunger? Time for the grand finale. With trembling fingers I activated a flare, the sudden hiss and burst of blinding light piercing the ruddy gloom. The effect on the machine was startling. It recoiled violently, its movements jerky and disoriented. My heart hammered against my ribs, vulnerable to light, highly sensitive. It was a start, a data point in this insane equation of survival. But the light was already fading, and as the shadows reclaimed the landscape, the machine recovered its composure. It took another step towards me, and I knew the experiment was over. Time to retreat and re-strategize. One last flare tossed straight at it. The burst of light seemed to confuse it further, buying me precious seconds as I turned and ran for the gaping maw of the airlock. I slammed back inside, cycling the airlock with frantic speed. Giles, the scientist, was back in the hot seat, and that chrome monster just became his most important lab rat. My lungs burned, each ragged breath a gasp of recycled air laced with the acrid tang of burnt magnesium. I ripped off the helmet and collapsed onto the hab floor, the room spinning sickeningly. That had been too close. Way too close. But adrenaline was a fickle mistress, replaced far too quickly by the icy fist of reality. Every minute I wasted was a minute closer to that thing figuring out a way in, and my pathetic delaying tactics weren't going to work forever. I needed answers, a plan, anything to tilt the scales back in my direction. I staggered back to my workspace, grabbing a fresh nutrient pack and sucking the contents down. Food was fuel, and fuel kept the brain working. My notes on the lichen were a mess. Theories intermixed with hastily scribbled observations about the machine's reactions. None of the pieces fit, and the frustration was a bitter taste in my mouth. That's when it hit me. Those tremors from the old Ares I report. Rhythmic, localized, and the description fit the machine's ungainly movements. Was it possible they were communicating through the ground somehow? Sending signals I was too blind to see? But how? Why? My eyes fell on a dusty piece of equipment shoved into a corner. The discarded seismometer from Ares II. Their mission had focused on atmospheric readings, not geology. What if it could still pick up signals masked by natural seismic activity? Hope ignited a sliver of warmth in the relentless Martian cold. With trembling hands I began rigging the seismometer, praying its sensors weren't damaged. Power surged through ancient wires and the readout surged to life. Nothing. Damn. Had I been chasing ghosts? Just static and the occasional minor tremor, the usual geological grumbling of the planet. Exhaustion pressed down on me, but I forced myself to focus. 
had to be a way to amplify, filter, inspiration as unpredictable as a Martian sandstorm struck the hab itself. This entire structure was designed to register even the tiniest shifts in pressure and vibration. My comm unit was useless, but the hab's central computer should still be able to access its sensors. I wired the seismometer into the mainframe with the frantic energy of desperation. The HAB's AI, used to monitoring oxygen levels and dust storms, was suddenly being bombarded with raw data. It would either make sense of it or fry itself trying. At first, chaos. A cacophony of seismic noise overlaid with the HAB's own hums and creaks. It was enough to drive a man insane, this symphony of a dying world. But wait. There, underneath it all, a faint pulse. Rhythmic, artificial, a signal. I was shaking as I isolated it, boosting the volume, and the Hab's speakers crackled into life. Not language, nothing I could understand, but a series of beeps and a strange undercurrent of subsonic hum. My heart hammered a frantic counterpoint. They were talking to each other, those machines. Coordinating. And that's when the horrifying truth sank in. My discovery wasn't a lifeline. It was a death sentence. They weren't just lurking under the sands. They were everywhere. Knowledge was a double-edged sword. Understanding the scope of the threat had a chilling clarity to it. No more desperate hopes of being the sole target. No more naive belief in a timely rescue. The Martian surface was their domain. They'd lain dormant, perhaps for centuries, and something, our arrival, our clumsy probings, had awakened them. One by one, they would emerge until the red sand was stained with a different kind of crimson. Despair threatened to swallow me whole. That was their tactic, wasn't it? Break us down, instill helplessness before they made their move. I couldn't allow myself that. I was no soldier, but my mind was my weapon and a cornered animal fights with a viciousness born of pure survival instinct. First priority, damage assessment. I moved like a man possessed, checking structural integrity, supplies, anything that might have been compromised in the attack. The good news was the main habitation dome was still secure. The bad news was everything else. One of the secondary supply pods was completely destroyed, and with the solar panels in tatters, I didn't have the resources for consistent power. Then a small flame of hope ignited, perhaps the only one. The Ares Protocol had a last resort, a failsafe buried deep within the mountains of useless regulations and red tape, the long-range emergency transmitter. Its signal was weak, temperamental, but it was designed to punch through even the worst of Martian atmospheric interference. And interference was something I now had a surplus of. Rigging the emergency transmitter was a delicate operation. Every wire, every connection had to be perfect, or I'd be wasting precious time and power. It took hours, hands growing numb in the thin atmosphere of my suit. My eyes stung, exhaustion clawing at my focus. Yet, it was the most alive I'd felt in days. Not with purpose but with a desperate, defiant energy. Finally, it was ready. I sank onto a stool before the transmitter console, heart pounding. Terra firma was a lifetime and a light speed transmission away. Every word I uttered could be my last, my only legacy. I keyed the mic. This is Giles Aldrin, sole survivor of the Ares III colony, Mars, requesting immediate... Hell, I'm requesting any damn assistance available. We are under attack by, by unknown entities, likely indigenous, highly technologically advanced, hostile, and, and numerous. I faltered, the sheer scope of the situation threatening to overwhelm me again. Focus, Giles, stick to the facts. Repeat, we are not dealing with a natural phenomenon. Need immediate evacuation protocols, maximum military readiness. Their tech seems vulnerable to concentrated light frequencies, potential for... My voice cut off abruptly as the Hab's lights wavered and died. I swore, the emergency lighting casting the room in an eerie, blood-red glow. No power, 
not even for the transmitter. That thing had found a way to cut me off mid-sentence. I pounded the console. The futility of it rang out in the silence. Then, a cold determination settled over me. If they thought they could silence me, they were dead wrong. I still had voice, and they couldn't take away the Martian sky. Racing to the airlock, I ripped my helmet off, sucking in lungfuls of the frigid, oxygen-thin air. It seared my throat, each breath a struggle, but I wouldn't go quietly. Terra firma, can anyone hear me? The dust storms would distort my words, scatter the signal, but volume might brute force its way through. Ares 3 under attack. Repeat under attack. Survivors, none. None that I can see. I paused, scanning the horizon. The red dune stretched into eternity, broken only by the dark, inscrutable shapes of other habitation domes. Was I truly the last? They're machines! I shouted until my voice cracked until my lungs threatened to burst. Technology beyond anything we've imagined. They've been here all along, under the surface, and God only knows how many there are. I slumped back inside, sealing the airlock. The silence was deafening now. It was time for my final act of defiance. It was time to leave my own mark upon this unforgiving world. My world had shrunk down to the dim red glow of emergency lights within the hab. It was eerily reminiscent of the first day, when the novelty of being the lone caretaker of Ares III was still an adventure, not a prison sentence. Only, back then, I'd been brimming with naive excitement, not the grim acceptance that danced on the edge of despair. No more time for reflection. Oxygen was dangerously low, and the CO2 scrubbers were on their last legs without power to cycle them. Time. That relentless enemy was ticking away the final hours of my existence. An idea was born, fueled by that defiant spark that kept me moving. If the transmission had cut off, if death out there on the sands was inevitable, well, I'd leave my message the old-fashioned way. They might stop my voice, but they couldn't erase my footprints. With renewed purpose, I suited up once more, that familiar ritual now laced with the bitter irony of donning my own burial shroud. Every hiss of escaping air from the suit seals was a countdown, every creak of the joints a funeral march. Step one, find the perfect canvas. I needed flat ground, relatively sheltered from the worst of the dust storms. With agonizing slowness, I made my way towards what remained of the solar array, a twisted testament to the machine's destructive power. Perfect. The metal would be resistant enough to hold a mark and raised well above the shifting sands. Step two, the tools. Back inside the hab, I raided the workshop, bypassing the usual scientific equipment. A crowbar for the larger strokes, a broken shard of glass for finer details. This wasn't about delicate diagrams or calculations. This was about leaving a primal scream etched onto the face of Mars itself. The wind whipped against me as I worked, stinging my eyes and coating me in red grit. Letter by crude letter, the message took shape. A warning sign as old as humanity itself. The stark silhouette of a skull. Not in memorial, though, no. This skull was crowned, not by laurels, but by the segmented nightmare of a machine, its pitted chrome surface scored into the canvas. Each scratch made my hands tremble, a physical reaction to the horror burned into my soul. Below I added a single word, just in case the visuals weren't enough. Danger. Simple. Brutal. Universal. This was my legacy. A tombstone for the colony, perhaps for mankind, if we weren't fast enough, clever enough to heed the warning. Finally, exhausted and barely able to see for the grit in my eyes, I stumbled back to the airlock. The climb up the ladder took every ounce of strength I had left. I fumbled with the seal, desperate for sanctuary, however temporary it might be. The hab felt colder, more barren than ever. Stripped of power, it was just an empty shell, a metal coffin mirroring my own inevitable fate. The irony wasn't lost on me. I found an unused oxygen tank and dragged it over to my workstation, cracking the seal just enough to provide a trickle of breathable air. It wouldn't last long, but then again, 
neither would I. With my last reserves of energy, I sat down and began to write. Not a transmission, not a warning, my final log. It was oddly peaceful, the acceptance. I wrote about my hopes for the lichen, silly theories about Martian evolution, even a bad pun about my protein bars. It was a desperate attempt to cling to the man I was, not just the victim circumstance had made me. My vision swam, the words distorting on the screen as the precious oxygen grew thinner. This was it. The end of Giles Aldrin. Botanist, janitor, and perhaps the last defiant voice of humanity on the angry red planet. And damn it, I wasn't going to let those chrome bastards win so easily. I wasn't dead. That startling fact filtered through my hazy, oxygen-starved brain. My vision blurred in and out of focus, the stark reality of the hab shifting to disturbing hallucinations of chrome monstrosities closing in. Movement, then a cool presence on my face, a rasping, mechanical whirring beside my ear. My fading strength surged back in a burst of panic-fueled adrenaline. It was here! The machine had breached the hab, come to finish the job. With a wordless roar, I lashed out, my fist glancing off something smooth and hard. Glass shattered, and a sharp pain lanced through my knuckles. The whirring sound intensified, closer, and a strange pressure settled on my chest. Then, a sudden lifting, as if a great weight had been removed, followed by cool air washing over my sweat-soaked skin. I blinked vision finally clearing. The hab was still intact, no sign of the machine. In my oxygen-deprived delirium, had I imagined it all? No, there. On the floor, a tangle of tubes and wires connected to a small, sleek device, unfamiliar, compact, and distinctly non-human in design. Was, was this some kind of medical equipment? A tremor went through me. They hadn't come to kill, They'd come to... study? Experiment? The realization was even more unsettling. But the undeniable truth remained. I was alive. The thin stream of oxygen trickling from the device had saved me in the nick of time. Why? My scientist brain, stubbornly refusing to shut down, started churning through possibilities. Curiosity? A perverse sense of mercy? Or, more chillingly, was there a greater purpose to keeping me alive? I dragged myself over to the device, fumbling with unfamiliar controls. My vision tunneled again. Damn. Time was running out. Blackness was creeping in from the edges when I managed to activate a small view screen. My first clear look outside in... How long? The view wasn't of the Martian wasteland as I expected. It was... Internal. A cavernous, dimly lit space, and within it, shapes, hundreds of them, chrome, glinting dully in the gloom. Machines standing motionless, arranged in precise rows. Were they dormant or waiting? And then something moved in the back. A larger machine, its form subtly different, purposeful. It moved with unsettling fluidity towards a raised platform in the centre of the chamber, my stomach lurched violently. On that platform, secured with metallic restraints, was a human body, unmoving. Dead? My clouded vision couldn't make out the details, but a surge of despair threatened to extinguish the last bit of hope that had propelled me this far. Then the body twitched. Alive, another prisoner, brought here for whatever macabre purpose these machines had. I pounded on the viewscreen, a futile scream trapped behind my teeth. I didn't know who that person was, but they weren't alone anymore. I wasn't alone anymore. The machine on the platform reached out to the restrained human, a segmented limb unfolding, and on its tip, a blinding pinpoint of light. The human body jerked, a silent cry of agony. The light intensified, and I watched in horror, my own helplessness burning hotter than any Martian sun. They weren't experimenting for knowledge. They were dissecting, probing, seeking those same elusive answers that I was. And they had a live specimen to pick apart. 
A jolt went through my body and the view screen died. The oxygen supply had finally given out, as the darkness closed in yet again. It wasn't fear that consumed me, but an iron resolve. I was no longer prey. I was a fellow lab rat, granted a horrifying glimpse into the mind of the enemy. And even lab rats, when cornered, can bite back. Consciousness returned in jolts, like a faulty light bulb sputtering against the encroaching dark. It took agonizing moments to separate the roaring in my ears from the whirring of machinery. But I was alive. The thin tendrils of the device snaked around my mask again, refilling my starved lungs. Each breath renewed my fury, a stubborn defiance against my captors. The image of the tortured prisoner seared itself into my mind, twisting that fury into a sharp-edged resolve. I couldn't save them. Hell, I could barely save myself. But I could do something. I had to. My surroundings were clearer now. I wasn't back in the hab. Yet I wasn't in that vast machine-filled cavern either. This space was smaller, more utilitarian. Operating theatre? Experiment chamber? The thought made bile rise in my throat. Then my gaze settled on a workbench nearby. Tools, crude by human standards, designed for their multi-jointed appendages but familiar in purpose. Scalpels, probes, and a device that looked suspiciously like a cauterizing laser, the same technology, perhaps, that had seared the prisoner back in their underground sanctum. A plan began to form, hazy at first, then crystallizing with the desperation of a drowning man clinging to driftwood. They wanted to study me? Fine. I'd give them a damn show. With agonizing slowness, I edged closer to the bench. Each rustle of my protective suit felt amplified in the unnatural silence. One tremor, one false move, and whatever semblance of freedom I had would vanish. My fingers, clumsy in the bulky gloves, finally closed around the handle of the laser device. It was heavier than expected, the power source strangely warm to the touch, active, even better. Step two, the oxygen supply. My lifeline, and now potentially my weapon. I began fumbling with the intricate valves and tubes of the machine. The goal wasn't to disable it entirely. That would be a quick death sentence. The goal was control. A way to increase the flow. One wrong touch. My heart pounded a frantic rhythm against my ribs. A hiss. I'd done it. A richer, faster flow of oxygen rushed into my mask. It was exhilarating and terrifying all at once. I glanced at the device I still held. Concentrated oxygen, the right catalyst. I knew what I had to do. It was insane, the last desperate gamble of a man with nothing left to lose. Yet, beneath the terror, grim satisfaction sparked. If I was going to die, I'd go out on my own terms. I stumbled towards the main door of my cell. No lock, no obvious release mechanism, just a smooth, unnervingly pristine surface. I held my breath, aimed the laser, and triggered it. A blinding burst of light and heat, the concentrated oxygen ignited against the metal of the door, the reaction searingly bright. The laser sputtered, the power source rapidly draining, but it was enough. Thick, acrid smoke billowed into the chamber. Somewhere an alarm must have blared, a whirring of unseen machinery responding to the disruption. I staggered back, eyes stinging. Through the haze, the door began to buckle, the superheated metal turning an angry red. Another minute, two at most, and it would give way. They'd come for me then, furious, ready to restrain their defiant specimen. The thought brought its own strange sense of peace. This pathetic, bulky suit, my cocoon of survival, was now a funeral shroud. I raised the sputtering laser again. This time, there would be no escape. The door buckled further, smoke pouring inwards. Behind it, shadows moved. My finger tightened on the trigger. It was time to end this, not with a whimper, but a blinding, defiant blaze of my own making. Giles Aldrin, the last man on Mars, would go out on his terms. He'd leave his mark on this unforgiving world, not as a victim, but as a defiant force against the unfeeling dark. The door warped outwards with a screech, Molten metal glowing at the point of rupture. 
expecting chrome monstrosities to surge through, I braced myself. Instead, the acrid smoke was pierced by a beam of raw white light. Not the harsh focused light the machines favoured, something else. Then from within the distortion, a voice emerged, crisp and unmistakably human. Giles Aldrin, stay perfectly still. Respond if you can. My mind, primed for alien horrors, couldn't process it. More figures emerged from the smoke, not machines, but humans in protective gear, visors reflecting the warped remains of the door. Humans? Here? Aldrin! The voice came again, insistent. Not if you hear me! I managed a jerky nod, the laser clattering from my numb fingers. Thank God! The lead figure rushed towards me, the others cautiously flanking them. A woman, her face lined with stress and... Was that hope? She carefully detached the oxygen supply device from my helmet. I'm Major Anya Bishop, she said briskly, checking readings on the device. Special retrieval, Ares contingency. You're going to be okay. The relief washed over me in dizzying waves. I slumped to the floor, too exhausted to even question the impossible. They were here. They were real. I wasn't alone. Anya's team worked with an efficiency that hinted at grim practice. Within minutes, I was stripped of the damaged hazard suit and bundled into a pressurized transport pod. Questions bubbled to the surface, but my ravaged body simply couldn't form the words. Rest, Anya said, her voice surprisingly gentle. We'll debrief when you're stronger. For now, know this. The nightmare's over, Mr. Aldrin. You're safe. Safe. The concept seemed as distant as the blue skies of my homeworld. I drifted into an exhausted, fitful sleep, punctuated by flashes of chrome figures and the searing image of that captive on the operating table. When I awoke properly, it was to the blessed ordinariness of a medical bay. Not the luxurious kind back on Earth, but functional. Sterile. Anya stood by the window, gazing at the Martian sunset, painting the bland walls in an illusion of warmth. Welcome back to the land of the living, she said, turning. The lines were deeper on her face, the hope tempered with something darker. How? was all I could manage. Turns out, even the most carefully calculated contingency plans have loopholes. She smiled wryly. The emergency beacon you activated. That signal was faint, intermittent. A glitch, according to the experts. I'm the kind who double-checks glitches, Anya moved to the bedside, especially when they originate from a colony as crucial as Ares III. She filled me in with clipped efficiency. A rescue ship, prepped under the flimsy veil of supply run, diverted the moment that final fragmented transmission came through. They'd arrived within hours of the colony's destruction, expecting the worst. Following the trail of damaged machinery, They'd managed to locate the underground machine hive. And then, my message. Crude, but undeniably clear, Anya's lips quirked. Your little bonfire was the beacon that led us straight to your cell. I closed my eyes, the sheer luck of it overwhelming. The other prisoner? Her expression hardened. Too late. By the time we breached their facility, they'd dissected him. But his sacrifice led us to you, Mr. Aldrin. That debt won't be forgotten. A surge of cold fury washed away the lethargy. They're still out there. Neutralized. For now, Anya said, her tone grim. We took their central hub, but they're scattered across the planet, decapitated but not destroyed. The war, it seemed, was far from over. But this time, humanity wouldn't be fighting blind. I sat up straighter, the ache in my bones overridden by a relentless determination. I know their weakness, I said. Light. And... I hesitated. The image of that tortured prisoner blazing in my mind. I have a pretty good idea of what they're looking for. Anya's gaze sharpened. This was no longer a rescue, but a strategy session. The botanist turned lab rat had just become their most valuable asset. Giles Aldrin, the last man on Mars, was ready to fight back. The transition from patient to war room strategist was disconcertingly swift. Barely out of the medical bay, I found myself hunched over maps, 
the red plains of Mars marked with stark black dots, each one the suspected location of a machine hive. We'd struck hard at their heart, but the limbs of this monstrous network still twitched. Anya was relentless, drilling me about their behavior, their technology, any detail that could be turned into a weapon. My experiences were dissected with clinical precision, every horrifying nuance feeding the war machine that hummed to life around me. It was brutal, necessary work, the only way to honor the lives lost and prevent more from joining them. Between sessions, I'd dream not of red sands nor chrome horrors, but of my lichen samples back at the hab. Had those machines, in their ruthless quest for knowledge, discovered what I'd only begun to suspect? Could the key to our enemy's downfall lie in the most unassuming life form on this desolate world? The thought became a lifeline, a desperate hope to drown out the constant hum of dread. Each night, Anya would leave a slim data tablet by my cot. Not sleep aids, but mission reports. Files on similar encounters from the first Ares expeditions. Hushed up incidents deemed equipment failures and geological tremors. I devoured them, connecting long forgotten dots, piecing together a chilling history. These machines, they weren't invaders. They were the original inhabitants, the true Martians, forced into the subterranean depths as environmental changes made the surface uninhabitable. And now, their long dormancy stirred by our clumsy colonization efforts, they were reclaiming what was theirs. The irony sent a bitter chill down my spine. We were the invaders, stumbling blind into a conflict older than humanity itself. And yet we couldn't back down. Not with their insatiable thirst for biological knowledge. Not with the haunting image of that tortured prisoner forever burned into my memory. This wasn't just survival anymore. It was a fight against extinction. One report stood out. From Ares 1, a decade ago. A scout's account of finding an ancient structure half buried in the dunes. A brief glimpse inside before his suit malfunctioned, forcing him back. He'd dismissed it as a relic, but his descriptions of intricate carvings of an energy source deep beneath. Could that be the key? Their power source, their central node. Desperate, I presented the theory to Anya. She was skeptical, yet something in my certainty gave her pause. It's a long shot, she admitted. But right now, every long shot is worth taking. Anya Bishop, the woman who defied protocol and found me in my tomb, was willing to gamble on ghosts and a botanist's hunch. Somehow that was more reassuring than any battle plan. Within hours, we were airborne. Anya, a lean, battle-hardened presence beside me, a squad of her best outfitted behind us in the crammed troop carrier. Below the Martian landscape unfurled, a canvas of rust and shadow. My heart clenched. Every inch of that unforgiving world was soaked in blood. Theirs and ours. Yet if I was right, our unlikely alliance with the ghosts in the sand had a chance to end the cycle of violence. The scout's coordinates led us to an expanse of windswept dunes. Anya surveyed the instruments with a soldier's practiced eye. Seismic disturbances here, but faint, inconsistent. Could be natural shifts. Or they've learned to mask their presence, I retorted, the relentless Martian wind whipping the words away. This was it. Our final gamble. We descended as dusk painted the sands in shades of blood and fire. The air crackled with tension and an undercurrent of dread. This wasn't just a mission, it was an act of cosmic defiance. Humanity pitting its will against the remnants of an older, more ruthless civilization. The excavation proved brutal. Sand gave way with infuriating reluctance. Gear malfunctioned and fear whispered doubts in our ears. Twice we struck inert rock, forcing us to shift our efforts and prolonging the agonizing search. With each false hope, with each grain of grit clinging to my sweat-drenched skin, the chilling possibility of failure loomed larger. Had I misread the signs? 
Was my desperate hope just a cruel mirage born of isolation and trauma? And then, a tremor. Not the usual, natural groans of the planet, but a rhythmic thrum, a heartbeat deep beneath our feet. Anya's eyes met mine over the chasm we had carved in the Martian soil. We found it, she said, the faintest hint of wonder piercing her battle-hardened composure. The entrance was unassuming, a crack that the relentless sandstorm had partially obscured. The carvings were unmistakable, reflecting the scout's garbled descriptions. Whirls and geometric patterns that seemed to radiate with an energy beyond our comprehension. Their writing, I ventured, a shiver trailing down my spine. Or oh, their warning, Anya replied grimly. Get your light rigs ready. The descent into the inky depths was a stark transition from the vastness of the surface. The tunnels were unnervingly smooth, the air stale and heavy. I led the way, my helmet light a pathetic lance against the pervasive gloom. We reached the central cavern, and even the hardened soldiers gasped. It was a cathedral of machines, not the utilitarian hive I'd endured, but a vast, vaulted space filled with structures that defied easy description. Consoles flashed with alien symbols, spheres glowed with unknown energy, and in the center, the source. A crystalline structure, its core a mesmerizing vortex of swirling light, not unlike a miniature sun. This was what they had burrowed for eons to protect, the lifeblood of their entire subterranean civilization, and astonishingly beautiful. There was an awful symmetry to it that this marvel of alien engineering, this source of unfathomable power, was also the key to their destruction. Anya's voice cut through my awestruck contemplation. Signal back to the ship. Tell them to prep the payload. Maximum intensity, and get us a timer. We'll set it for 20 minutes. That should give us enough time to clear the tunnels. Her practicality snapped me back to the situation. Of course. There was no need for theatrics, just strategic annihilation. While the ship prepared, Anya and her team began rigging the central structure with precision. Every wire, every charge meticulously placed for maximum impact. I watched them, doubt tugging at me was obliterating their source of power genocide? Or was it the only way to ensure the safety of future colonists, of humanity itself? My time with the machines had blurred the lines between enemy and victim. We retreated back up the tunnels, Anya barking out orders. Every step further from the heart of the machine network felt like a victory against the creeping despair. As we reached the shadowed entrance, I took one last look at the intricate carvings, now forever tainted by the horrors I'd witnessed. Anya checked her chrono. Five minutes until detonation, let's move. We clambered out into the fading light. The Martian sands, once a symbol of desolation, now seemed to promise a new dawn. With a final glance back at the carved entrance, now an unmarked tomb, we began our trek back toward the landing zone. The explosion came as a distant rumble, then a rolling tremor that shook the very ground beneath our feet. We watched, transfixed, as the sand above the buried structure churned, then collapsed inwards in a billowing cloud. When the dust settled, the only evidence of the vast machine complex was a crater in the desolate expanse. The machines across Mars, severed from their source, would likely fall dormant their reign of terror over. We had won, not with heroics, but with cold strategic calculation. On the horizon, the rescue ship appeared. As we boarded, I couldn't shake the feeling of loss. Awe mingled with unease at the memory of that beautiful, deadly power source. Perhaps destroying it had been necessary, but it left a void a chilling reminder of the ancient forces slumbering beneath the surface of this deceptively barren world. The journey back to Earth was swift. Medical checks, debriefings, a strange attempt to return to normalcy. Yet, I knew nothing would ever be truly normal again. I had touched the boundary between science and survival, 
witnessed the remnants of a civilization far older than our own. Back on Earth, I was hailed as a hero, the survivor of the Ares III disaster. Eventually, the media frenzy died down, and I retreated to a quiet lab, a world of controlled experiments and verifiable data. Humanity would return to Mars. It was in our nature. Colonization would be slower, cautious, scarred by the memory of the chrome machines. But in that caution, there was also wisdom. Perhaps one day Mars might even bloom again, not with a fragile lichen, but with the seeds of a tenuous understanding, a testament to the impossible resilience of life, theirs and ours.